We're totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll out! We are totally booked. Welcome to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Subscribe and follow on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok videos weekly. Links to all the social media sites at bookedonrock.com. Morgan Brown is our guest to talk about his new book, Van Halen, Every Album, Every Song. Van Halen is undoubtedly one of the most influential rock and roll bands America has ever seen. Morgan takes readers through the band's classic albums, charting their ascent from Sunset Strip amateurs to chart-topping arena rockers and beyond. Exploring the components of their music and its inspirations, as well as introducing us to the musicians behind the songs, including the late Edward Van Halen, the one-of-a-kind frontman David Lee Roth, and Sammy Hagar, who revitalized the band when he took the reins. This book is perfect for new fans and longtime fans like myself. I put together a playlist of Van Halen, which you can find on the show notes page. But first, here is Morgan Brown. Morgan, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. Always great to talk to a fellow Van Halen fan. I want to talk about your history as a fan of Van Halen. And being from the UK, it's interesting because here in the States, Van Halen toured all the time, you know, almost year in and year out for a while there in the early days with Dave. But in the UK, it was different after that 78 tour. I think maybe a few times they came around. When did you become a fan and what kind of fan base did the band have in the UK when you were growing yeah, up? It, it's an interesting one. I, I think they definitely, they've had some success in the UK, but nowhere near the kind of um, sort of cultural saturation that you get in, in the States, I think. Um, so I definitely as a kid, I had to do a bit of detective work to, to find out about Van Halen. I guess uh, the first thing I would have heard uh, Eddie Van Halen playing on would have been um, Beat It. I guess that that came out when I was about four years old. So that was always in the background all the way through, like as long as I was aware of popular music, really. And I, I started to get interested in the guitar, I kind of realized that, what is this amazing guitar solo? I had to do some digging around to find out who played it and then realized that oh, there's a band called Van Halen. That That must be the band that this guy's from went and found a cassette uh i, I went to woolworths um which oh, was yes. like the nearest place that had any music woolworths. i was nine years old i think saved up my pocket money and they had two van halen albums um one of which was van halen 2 one of which was ou812 which i guess had just come out around that time being completely clueless i just went for the newest one i was like well the, the newest one must be the best right um, but I, I thought it was amazing. I'd never heard anything like it. Obviously, I was like dead, nine years old, just completely blew my head off. And then obviously saved up my pocket money again to go back and buy Van Halen 2. I didn't know they had two different singers, so it was completely different. I was like, what's going on? And then gradually, you know, read everything I could, bought every record I could find and and went from there, really. But yeah, Isn't that weren't... interesting, though? I mean, that's so interesting because here in the States, it would be really a whole different story. It's I heard Eruption for the first time, uh, you know, or my older brother, like for me, my older brother played Eruption um, or a lot of the older generation would say, I saw the band on the strip, Sunset Strip. Uh, But for me, I discovered them in 88 and it was through OU812. My friends kept banging on me, man. You got to listen to this. You got to listen to this. That's my personal favorite Sammy era album. So not a bad way to start. And Van Halen 2 is a great album as well. It's it's underrated because of van halen one it's it's a great so, yeah yeah great collection of songs but yeah how about that it all starts with michael jackson and the beat it solo yeah that's interesting you couldn't get off to a, a better start to a recording career than this band did with that 78 self-titled debut released february 10th 1978 reached number 19 went on to sell 10 million copies ted templeman the producer engineered by don landy an important name in van halen uh-huh. history they would be the team behind the sound of Van Halen for all of the Roth era albums. And this album has timeless classics, radio staples, running with the devil. You really got me. Ain't talking about love. Jamie's crying ice cream, man. The album tracks. I'm the one atomic punk. Feel your love tonight. Little dreamer on fire. And then there is the instrumental you may have heard of called eruption. (laughs) And as you point out in the book, there are hints of Dick Dale's surf rock, some classical influences and a nod to the band cactus. 
Can you talk about those influences and the techniques that Eddie's using here to create eruption? You write about that in the book. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've obviously, like a lot of Van Halen fans, I've, I've played guitar for, for years, so I've just always been in, in awe of his playing. And um, yeah, I, I believe some of the first mu- pop, sort of popular music that the Van Halen brothers would have got into when they came to, to the States uh, was was surf music. I guess that was the sound of California at that point. Dick Dale definitely uh, with that sort of high-speed tremolo picking, that's like definitely the influential sound in surf. And it, I think Eddie's like speedy tremolo that you do get in Eruption and a lot of his other playing, I'd like to think that probably comes from that. I'm not 100 I don't think I've ever read him talking about Dick Dale, but I've definitely read him uh, interviews where he's he's said that, you know, he grew up with, with surf music and that would have definitely been the background. But then, yeah, once you get into the the two-handed tapping section, uh, obviously that's the, the technique that's most closely associated with Eddie Van Halen, although, as I think I say, there were other people who've been experimenting with that for years before. Uh, I don't think there's ever anyone who really sort of incorporated it into their whole style in the way that, that Eddie had. Um, and he's he's pulling out these sort of neoclassical kind of triplets that um, it's like something out of Bach, the chord progression. It's, it's something you don't really hear in heavy rock or certainly didn't at that time. I just listened to some interviews. Jazz Obrecht, the rock journalist, has been releasing a lot of these audio interviews with Ed from late 70s or 1980, 81. And one of them, Eddie's talking about how he was listening to classical music, how he was so into it. It certainly was something that was part of his, just one part of the influences that he had that went into his sound. I mean, the guy was brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's funny, really, trying to pick apart his influences because it, it could be particularly, particularly early on. It was quite cagey about letting too much slip about what had influenced his style. I think he was really worried about other people trying to mimic him, but you can really tell he was just absorbing everything and things that he heard, he'd just find a way of reproducing, even if it was totally different to the way the person who he, he'd heard would have done it. And you'd definitely see that later on as well with things like um, the, the intro to little guitars as well. He could just hear something and reproduce it perfectly, even by a totally different means. Do you have a personal favorite track from Van Halen one and why? Oh, That's a tough That one. is tough. Yeah. Um, I, it probably changes on a daily basis. I, I'd, I'd often go back to um, Feel Your Love Tonight just because I, I think it's a magnificent pop song, really, as much as anything. And I think one of the things that really set the band apart from their contemporaries was just combining this really kind of hard-hitting rock, but with these gleaming pop melodies. I mean, the, the tunes could have been some kind of bubblegum song really but it's always got that rock solid kind of bass to it that just makes it the perfect kind of melding really it's almost like a beach boys influence in there with the harmonies yeah absolutely yeah and uh, yeah always michael anthony on top there just adding that kind of uh, little uh, special kind of shine yeah Yeah, it's it's not it's not easy but i would say since i put you to the challenge i should come (laughs) up with mine i guess just because i've been burned out on the hits you know the ones that have been on the radio i usually gravitate towards i think on fire the deep tracks are the ones that didn't get a lot of airplay i would say i love but you just can't there there isn't anything it's one of those albums where you say would would you do anything different or do you do you think is there anything on there you would remove or add it's really nothing Nothing. Yeah, absolutely. That it's it's just perfectly sequenced. It's it, every track's an absolute killer. They arrived sort of fully formed, really. I think they'd had a, a good long gestation period to work out any kind of uh, any any things that need to be removed. And by the time they arrived, everything was absolutely uh, in place, wasn't it? Playing them in the clubs, with the exception of Jamie's crying, that was the one that they yeah. came up with at the time. So let's talk about the second album, 1979. It's released. You say that the band is stretching out here and you write, quote, for me, it strikes a perfect balance between radio friendly fun and more intense, aggressive material. Dance the Night Away, still one of my all time favorite VH tunes. Beautiful Girls. Those are the two big singles. Somebody Get Me a Doctor. Out of Love Again. Light Up the Sky. Classic. They led with that on the 2015 tour, that last tour. Women in Love. DOA. And another instrumental. The acoustic track Spanish Mm -hmm. Fly. Dance the Night Away, my personal favorite top 20 hit number 15 yeah. interesting comment you make in the book about that one it's about the riff eddie plays it's based on major triads rather than typical heavy rock power chords can you talk about that 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's it probably a, a bit of a, a sort of nerdy guitar thing, really. But um, yeah, you don't get, certainly at the time, it didn't really get much in the way of kind of bright kind of major chords in, in heavy rock. There's a bit of a kind of received wisdom among guitar players that, oh, you just play the root and the fifth, and that gives you power. Uh, it sounds tough. It's, uh, you, you don't, don't want to play the third. It's it meant to make clashing harmonics with distortion and everything. And it's it's nonsense, obviously, as Eddie proves right away in that song. It's just, it, it, he plays major chords all the way through and it sounds glorious. And it still sounds powerful as well. It's just powerful without doing heavy rock cliche. Yeah, and it still feels like you're in the room with these guys recording those albums at Sunset Sound. They, they sound so good. I mean, Ted Templeman did a, a beautiful job just knowing to let them set up as pretty much as they would live and just record it that way. I mean, if you compare it to like the demo they did with Gene Simmons, which is very much kind of everyone's everyone's going to record their parts separately and we'll overdub this, we'll overdub this. It still sounds great because it's Van Halen, but it's it's a much more artificial sound and much less natural. 1980s Women and Children first. Here's an interesting album. It's overlooked, I would say, mm. by many. And The Cradle Will Rock and Everybody Wants Some, those are the standout tracks. One of my all-time favorite Van Halen tracks that few know about is Romeo Delight. And they <laughs> brought that back when they returned with Dave and Wolfgang he made up the set list for those tours and that's one he wanted in there and take your whiskey home too. your thoughts on this album. You say it falls into a Valley between the second album and the next album. Fair warning. In, in a way, um, I guess, cause there's just, there's a shift towards the darker tone, which kind of really comes out on the next album, but I, I love it. It's got its own character. It's definitely, it's, it's the rawest, heaviest kind of record that they made. I think, um, definitely sounds like they just kind of they've come off tour and they've run into the studio and they've just ripped through these songs which is exactly what they did but it, it's like there's definitely noticeably less of the pop edge there's less of the harmonies but just amazing riffs so much power um i think that's that's the overriding kind of impression from it although you still get the odd outlier like uh could this be magic just to to add a little uh, contrast there yeah, that's it's a song like that that I always think of that album as where they're really they're starting to stretch out. Yeah. They're starting to do some things, but then we get to Fair Warning, and this is many say this is Eddie at his finest moment. 1981's Fair Warning, and as you point out in the book, it's noticeably darker and heavier. It's the slowest selling of the Roth era albums yet. All these years later, many Van Halen diehards they see it as the band Eddie specifically. At their best, Mean Street, Unchained, So This Is Love, Hear About It Later, the highlights. Where do you place it among Van Halen's discography? A lot of days it's my favourite. Unchained, Mean Street, you can't go wrong, really. And But it's still got still got poppy moments, So This Is Love, I think, is, is a terrific... I don't, don't know how that wasn't a gigantic single. I, I think I, I speculated that maybe the rather disturbing picture sleeve might have put people off. Uh, they do a song called So This Is Love and have a, a picture of someone being beaten up on the front cover. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah, that, that was chosen by Alex, too. Yeah. What, what is Eddie doing to create that guitar sound on Unchained? Because this Ooh, is really yeah. probably his greatest moment. He's using a drop D tuning, which I guess is is pretty common now uh, in, in heavier styles of guitar playing. But playing again major major triads over that um like shifting around while keeping that kind of low heavy d kind of chugging away underneath uh i think he's got a, a flanger on there too which is like a, a major part of his, his sound in those days and it's just it sounds like the world ending that guitar sound it's amazing a few more overdubs than previously on this album i think him and don landy had uh, had formed a bit of a closer relationship so they were spending late evenings in the studio just adding extra layers while everyone else was was off partying and it, it does make for a, a bit of a denser kind of darker sounding record Sorry. years ago i remember hearing a rumor that eddie put a bass string in the guitar to get that sound but that was like an urban legend type of thing <laughs> But yeah, it sounds, uh, you know, it's like, what is he? Do well, that was the thing that was so great about it. It's like, what is he doing there? You know, what is it I'm even hearing on this? I, I think that was often the case with with things he was playing. A lot of the time he was just doing something for the first time that just no one else had ever thought of. And it's the constant just jaw-dropping moments on the guitar, definitely. 
You do speak in defense of Dave's vocals later in the book, but I also want to ask you about your thoughts on his vocals during the, these first six albums. Those days, I thought it was just so unique to the Van Halen sound. Absolutely. I think he's, it's such an essential part of the Van Halen sound. I get really annoyed when people, oh, well, you know, Dave was a showman, but Sammy could really sing. Like, Dave could really sing. I don't think he's a natural singer like Sammy Hagar. I think he really had to work on it. But there's he brought so much to the band. There's so many different influences in his his vocals. You, you hear bits of, uh, bits of old-style blues. You hear bits of soul in there. Um, there's a real showbiz kind of vaudeville style that he brings sometimes he can and he's a great interpreter of songs as well I think he rather than just sort of going out there and showing off he, he really inhabits the lyrics so one minute he's he can just be delivering this kind of powerful guttural shout and then the next minute he can sound really tender and vulnerable which I don't think is something people associate with him but if you listen to Push Comes the Shove from that album, that's that's such a, I think a really sensitive performance, which isn't something you'd think from from Dave Lee Roth. But uh, and another song that we're going to talk about, "Secrets" from Diver Down too. That's absolutely, another. yeah, yeah, and also the humor, of course. You know, <laughs> hey man, that suit is you. You know that all that stuff is just <laughs> classic. It's classic, and we talked about Unchained that that high note he hits right there. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and it's also important to remember too. He wrote these songs with Ed. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I don't think he really gets the credit that he deserves for a the lyrics, which I think are, are often brilliant, and the melodies as well. Because I, I think people just think, oh yeah, Eddie wrote wrote the music, but he yeah he wrote the riffs and the chords. But Dave wrote those melodies, and they're great melodies. Now the band's under pressure here from Warner Brothers to come up with another record after the band released the cover of Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman. Not a lot of time, so we have covers of The Kinks, Where Have All the Good Times Gone, the Martha and the Vandella song, Dancing in the Street, Big Bad Bill of Sweet William Now. That dates back to 1924. But I think this album gets a bad rap, unfairly labeled as a covers album. You've got some killer originals, Hang Em High, Secrets we just mentioned, Little Guitars you mentioned. The Full Bug is on this album, as good as anything you'll hear from the band. Is this an underrated album, in your opinion? Or are the critics right? Usually underrated. Um, I, I, yeah, to, to this day, I mean, I'm in loads of Van Halen fan groups, and I'll, I'll still see people kind of go, "Oh, it's the worst, the, the worst album by the original lineup." But it's great. It's so good. Um, as you say, all of the originals on there, like, there's not a, a dud moment. Um, every every song uh, is pretty much a classic, and I think those covers are, are superb as well. Really, just shows it's kind of shows them just expanding the range a bit. I, you know, I, I don't think any other band in that genre could have done the things that they did on that album. Big Bad Bill, it's, you know, some people will find it to be a novelty song and won't, won't like it, but I, I just think it's great. They carry it off so well. You know, Dave's made for that kind of stuff. It's really nice hearing their father, uh, Jan, playing with his sons. Um and yeah, Ed also, although I know Ed was really not into making that album at all, it's got some of his best playing on it. He covers so much ground and everything he plays is absolutely perfect. If uh, that best of volume one that came out in 96, he omitted that album entirely. If you were yeah. to pick one to put into that best of, what would you have chosen? Pretty Woman, Dancing in the Streets? Because that's Dancing in the Streets is my personal favorite cover, but I'm in the minority on that one. It's great, yeah. I, I, I think the the way they incorporated that synth riff into that and just completely transformed that song is 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 uh, spectacular. I think either of those would have been a, a great yeah. omission in there, but I would have liked to see one of the originals in there too. Uh, yeah, if yeah. I was if I was making that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess if you're going to go with the numbers, then you would go with Pretty Woman you, because you that was the biggest hit. But yeah. yeah, it's just a shame that Eddie felt that way about the album because those originals are great. So good. Then we get to, and this is why we, we get to what we hear in 1984, because finally Eddie's like, I'm done. I'm creating my own studio. And him and Don Landy create the 5150 studio right there, right where Eddie lives. So he can uh, be like a mad scientist. And he's sometimes he never left for like days. <laughs> and there's stories of <laughs> Ted Templeman and David Lee just waiting, literally waiting on the, on the lawn there. Like, when is he coming out? Uh, but their ascent continues with the album 1984. 
Now they're the biggest rock band in the world. A number two album, 10 million copies sold. Jump goes to number one. Panama, Hot for Teacher, huge on radio, huge on MTV. I'll Wait is a hit single, which I, I, re, I wish they had made a video for that. I always pictured like a video of Dave like as a detective or, you know, reading the magazine and he's trying to track down the girl in the magazine, but never happened. Don't know why. Um, but an interesting comment from your book regarding jump that Mark Farner of grand funk railroad just recently pointed out as well in an interview, the keyboard parts on jump written from a guitarist approach. And you say he's using the same harmonic structure on the keys as he does on the guitar here. Yeah, definitely. It's a thing that they, a lot of those um, classic Van Halen riffs are built on the same idea, just keeping a, a solid kind of pedal bass note going and then moving those, again, major triads around over the top. So it, it's it, you could imagine just viewing the keyboard the same way you do the guitar. That's kind of what you'd come up with. And it, it works beautifully. It just it translates perfectly over to, to the keyboard. Obviously, uh, Eddie is well, a classically trained pianist anyway, so... He had that advantage, which comes out in the, that instrumental section as well with those uh, elaborate flourishes he gets in there. Rounding out those hits, Top Jimmy, Drop Dead Legs, Girl Gone Bad, House of Pain. If you had to choose between this album and the 78 debut, which would you say is, is better or which is your favorite and why? For me, although 1984 has so many great high points, I'd I'd go back to the debut of, of the two. I think it's more even the quality is more even across the album and i think sonically it's a bit better too i think that sunset sound recording is is great uh obviously the 5150 allowed eddie so much more creative uh, control which is excellent for him but i think they made some compromises because of that you get alex starting to have to use a scaled down kit and like electric drums to fit to physically fit into the into the room which yeah, it's kind of the sound of the time, but um, it doesn't sound so good to my ears now. Interesting points, and they're all valid. I I go with 1984 just because from a personal standpoint, as a kid, seeing the video of Jump and listening to that album for the first time and just being blown away by it. I, I have to go with 1984, but you're right. I think from start to finish, the Van Halen debut beats out 1984. Because some people will say the House of Pain and Girl Gone Bad, those who are into the pop side of Van Halen don't like those songs. But if you're into the hardcore, heavier side of Van Halen, it's a welcomed departure from the keyboard yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're tremendous uh, workouts, particularly for, for Eddie and Alex. The playing on those is just phenomenal. Yeah, great riffs. I, I don't know if as sort of whole songs they're necessarily as satisfying as some of the songs on that debut but just collections of spectacular moments they're they're incredible interesting um, that wilson pickett's in the midnight hour was recorded for that album and yeah. it's done mixed the whole thing it's somewhere in the vaults i don't know if we'll ever hear it but that would be fascinating to listen to that would be an amazing thing to hear yeah um yeah, had the, the balance of power not swung further away from the sort of uh, Roth Templeman side of things, maybe we'd have we'd have actually got to hear that. Yeah. Hopefully, if there's going to be some archival release in the future, maybe some of these things will actually find their way out of the vaults because uh, I'd love to hear that. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. Morgan Brown is here to talk about his book, Van Halen, Every Album, Every Song. With 1986's 5150, the band proved they can move on without David Lee Roth. Number one album, huge hit singles here. Sammy Hagar on lead vocals, Why Can't This Be Love, Dreams, Best of Both Worlds, Love Walks In, Why Can't This Be Love, biggest hit of all the singles, that reached number three. You note a prog fusion influence here. It's when Sammy scats along with Eddie's offbeat, arpeggio-based guitar synth melody. Ed and Alex were big prog fusion fans. We also hear the progressive side of the band in the title track to 5152, that title track. I think it's a, it's an influence really that had been kind of creeping in a little bit more over the years preceding that too. Um, I, I know uh, Eddie was a particular fan of Alan Holdsworth um, and you, you get some of the more kind of out there guitar kind of stylings kind of coming in that, that don't sound like sort of uh, straight up heavy rock. And I think, yeah, the title track 5150 is a, noticeably a bit more adventurous, just sort of um, harmonically and in terms of the way it moves between different 
sections and things than than some of the other tracks on the album. It, there's otherwise there's a bit of a move more towards what you expect to hear from kind of a, a bit more of a radio rock band. I always think with fifty one fifty, but the title track I think just keeps that adventurous spirit that you hear in things like Girl Gone Bad and and stuff on the on the previous album that keeps that alive a little bit. When did you first hear fifty one fifty, and what was your impression of it? Because you're a Dave fan, I could tell from reading the book, you're a Dave fan. Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, I, I, as I say, my my first album was a, was a, a Sammy album. I I I, I guess I got fifty one fifty um, about a year after I got that first cassette. I loved it. I, I they could do no wrong for me at the time. Everything with Van Halen, and I just loved it. I was pretty obsessed. I, I had the the VHS of Live Without the Net as well. So all those live versions. Oh, um, man. Summer Nights and 5150, those two in particular. Yeah, absolutely incredible. So, uh, yeah, I was super into it. I bought the tablature book, couldn't play any of it, but really enjoyed looking at it and imagining <laughs> yeah. that I could play it. It's one that I go back to now and doesn't sound as great as it did when I was a kid, yeah. but I, that's, I still love it. Yeah, the drums are dated. That's the problem with it. But that was what was happening it, at the time. It was the time, definitely, absolutely. Like I, I didn't hear that at all when I was when I was when I was a kid. I just thought it sounded amazing. As I said, nineteen eighty eight when OU eight one two came out. That's when I became a fan. But it was this specific album, and I've told the story many times. But fifty one fifty was the one I listened to on Christmas Eve of eighty eight, and my older brother had it. That was the first time, like the goosebumps, you know. Yeah. And then I went back and got everything else. And, and but OU812 is still my personal favorite. Let's get to that one. Another number one album, Black and Blue, the lead single. That's interesting, right? An interesting choice for a first single. And it did go to number 34, surprisingly, because it's not a pop song. Yeah, I, I, I feel like they could definitely have, have uh, done better with a different selection. I think I, I feel like I was probably a little bit mean in retrospect to Black and Blue in the book. Now thinking back, I loved it. I loved everything on this album when I first first heard it. It was my first Van Halen album. Still got still got my original cassette and the LP that I bought later when the cassette wore out and the T-shirt. So I love it. But black and blue, it feels lazy now. Listening back, it's just it's not very inspired. It's a little bit sluggish. The lyrics, which I I, did, I didn't know what they meant when I was what, <laughs> nine. Um, right. Now I do know what they mean. <laughs> they kind of make me cringe. He's admitted the lyrics on, on this one. And I think it was also on, uh, what was the Source of Infection was source the one. Source of Infection, he just, yeah. You know, he he could have done better on. <laughs> but he had said the, the reason for the black and blue being a lead single was just because like he said, he, he, we just had, we just had the, the balls to do it. Like we just, we're yeah. going to do the opposite of what the label wanted us to like on fit to no videos were made when it's love. Of course, that's the one that becomes the huge hit. Number five, single finish what you started. Number 13 feel so good. Number 35 other standout tracks are mine all mine, which I love cobble mm. wobble. Absolutely love. I was happy to read your comments on feel so good because I've always been a fan of it, but I've been in the minority of it, just like with huh. dancing in the streets, but I got the feeling you would go with this power ballad over when it's love. Am I right? I, I absolutely would. Yeah. When it's love, it, it, this probably the one song that even when I was in my first flush of Van Halen fandom, it was just a little bit on the wimpy side something about that that particular kind of twinkly electric piano that crops up on so many ballads at that point in the 80s that always just sends a little bit of a kind of bad shiver down my spine like oh it's yeah it's not not one of my favorites i understand why it was so why it was successful it's it's great of its type it just doesn't really do it for me whereas i i think feel so good is for me it's a much it's just a it's a ballsier song um it sonically i think it's aged a lot better yeah the keyboard just sounds so cool yeah i don't think yeah. they ever played it live if if they did maybe once or twice yeah it's i, I don't understand why it's it's so underrated because yeah excellent song uh, th i think that there's a lot of a lot of really good high points on that album it's for me a, a big step up over 5150 the, there are some low points too but I think overall, it's 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 got plenty of strong parts. 
it's the pushback they got for songs like When It's Love that leads to the next one for Unlawful mm. Carnal Knowledge. Like they really wanted to prove they could still rock and they did. And the way the 90s started for Van Halen, it seemed like they were set for another huge decade. 1991's For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge goes to number one. In fact, every Sammy album went to number one. The number one rock radio singles, Pound Cake, Run Around, and Top of the World. Right now at number two, Top of the World reached number 27 on the Hot 100. My sleeper pick, Morgan, is Judgment Day. Yeah, gets Judgment better Day. with age. Gets better yeah. with age. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's uh, it's it's strong. It's a great great riff. And you call this album the most consistent album of the Sammy years? Is it their best, the Sammy? I I, I would say it's the one that I, I I most enjoy listening to from start to finish. Definitely, I I feel like you know there aren't any parts like when it's love where i find myself kind of going ah, i kind of wish this wasn't on here um i'm i'm pretty happy to just put it on and kind of you know rock out for the entire thing it was the first one that actually came out while i was an active van halen fan so i was there on the day it came out buying my copy and yeah I never kind of got quite past that uh that excitement about it and yeah, yeah it's 16 it is on there too a tribute yeah. to Wolfie, 316, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, which I guess we first heard in those in the midst of the guitar solo on the, the 5150 tour, right. and then he's repurposed as a, a lullaby for, for young Wolfie. Yeah, 316. After the release of the live album Right Here, Right Now in 93, Van Halen returned for what would be their last studio album with Sammy Hagar, 1995's Balance. Again, number one, number one mainstream rock track, Don't Tell Me What Love Can Do, number 30 single, Can't Stop Loving You, the number two rock radio single, Amsterdam, and Not Enough, which reached number 97 on the Hot 100. The Seventh Seal, a number 36 mainstream rock track. The band's at odds during the recording of this album. An interesting backstory to Don't Tell Me What Love Can Do. Sammy and Eddie battled over the lyrics, and Eddie won out. What was the issue? I think Sammy wanted it to be a, a positive song. He wanted us to be singing, uh, I want to show you what love can do. It's uh, an, a sort of, uh, I think it's written in response to Kurt Cobain. Uh, he wanted to to sort of say, uh, I, I don't, I never quite understood what his message was with this really, but was, I think he wanted to to say, well, you know, if, if things aren't so bleak. Here's what love can do. Things are going to be okay. Yeah, or if someone, if there was someone who really loved him, he would have been okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you you could if if you if you have love, then you know there's no need for this despair. It's all going to be all right. And I think Eddie's response to that was, "No, it's wimpy." And then it became, you know, the the, the sort of the exact inverse of what uh, Sammy originally wanted it to be. And it it is a bleak song as a result, I think. But. Uh, I guess rather more in tune with kind of the, the the sort of fairly downbeat tone of a lot of rock at the time. It is a badass um, riff from Eddie, though. It is. I mean, you can't deny it. It's, simple, it's a, right? It's it's pretty simple, but it sounds powerful. And I think a lot of the the guitars on that record, he's really trying to get away from kind of the more of the kind of showboaty style of, of a lot of the earlier records and just get into that sort of like raw kind of nasty sounding kind of power that a lot of the kind of grunge and post grunge bands had, had sort of brought in. I think there's a lot of tension musically on that record between parts of it that are trying to pull back to the more familiar sounds and then parts that are pulling away into sort of more contemporary things. It's uh, it's 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 an awkward listen in that respect, I think, because there's a bit of a crisis of identity going on, I think. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Not Enough. I'm surprised no, that Eddie was okay I, with those lyrics. You like it. I know a lot of people I, like it. I, 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 I quite liked it, yeah. I, okay. I think ballad-wise, out of the Sammy era, I, I prefer it to some of the other stuff. Maybe just musically, I don't know. It's got a bit more of a kind of a little bit more of a sort of organic kind of late Beatlesy feel to me, which, okay. which I quite like. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, my super um, pick is Aftershock. Yeah. You see, it doesn't do it for me at all. No, right. Funny. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting <laughs> how that can happen. Yes, absolutely. And can't stop loving you was a huge hit. It's a little more, well, it's one that they asked Eddie to write. They said, there's no hit. We need a hit. Yeah. Which shows I, I, you how talented he is. Okay. Here you go. 
definitely. But and like, it's, why can't this be love? A little more musically sophisticated. It's perfect radio rock, but it kind of feels like it's designed to be perfect radio rock. It's it's almost generic, which is something Van Halen never really right. were at, at their peak for me. Um, but you know, great, and people love it, rightly so. And the production, Bruce Fairbairn on that yeah. album. If I always say, if you could have put that production on OU812. Mm. Whoa. Yeah. Well, they're remastering all the Sammy era stuff. So we'll see. It'll be we'll really see. interesting to see how that comes out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause it's long overdue. It's, it seems crazy that, that we've just been listening to the same editions of those for, for all these years. Let's talk about the Dave songs on 96's best of volume one, two songs, the band record me wise magic and can't get this stuff no more. And Dave's back on vocals, first time since 1984. What did you think of them at the time? Have your views changed over the years on those two songs? I think, whereas with a lot of the Sammy era stuff, I just unconditionally loved it at first and then like it maybe a little more conditionally now. I've gone the opposite way with those those Dave songs. I, I think at the time, my expectations were so high, unreasonably high. Exactly. Same I here. Was, I was just bound to be a bit disappointed. Whereas now, I mean, I have to say can't get this stuff no more is a bit more of a, glow, a grower. It's a, it's a bit low key. I think people would have not been expecting that, but I think it's, it's a really good song. It's, it's not spectacular, but it's, it's got some good stuff going on. And Me Wise Magic, I think is actually like pretty amazing. Yes. Yes. Me Wise Magic is great. I like both. Love yeah. me wise magic, but you're right. The expectations were we were thinking we we're going to hear something like old school Van Halen lyrically as much as musically. And Dave's writing about some dark stuff. It's amazing and that it, they could even get those two songs done. Yeah, it, it's it's remarkable. They managed to hold things together long enough to 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 do that. Yep. I mean, certainly from everything we've seen and heard about that period in time, it's yeah, we're we're lucky to have those. So uh, yeah, just thank and, Walter. And by the time they came out, it was already done. Like the whole, yeah. this whole possible Dave coming back thing had already blown up. I mean, that was done. And we get 1998's Van Halen 3 with Gary Sharon, produced by Mike Post. Very odd choice, best known for writing TV theme music. This album has taken quite a beating over the years from fans and critics. Michael Anthony was even saying, Mike Post, he wasn't, never produced a rock album before. And he looked back on it. It was the only time where they didn't record a song where they were all in the same room together or write a song in the same room together. It was yeah. just, it was just odd. And Alex is going through a divorce, the whole thing, but it did reach number four when it debuted and the lead single without you that debuted at number one on the mainstream mm. rock tracks chart, which is often forgotten. You do like the tracks fire in the hole and primary, but overall the album has many problems. What are the reasons you feel this album didn't and still doesn't work? I think there were a lot of issues, sadly, with it. Uh, I, I, you know, there are, it, it's still Van Halen to some extent, so the, there are bits that you can find that, that are, are worth listening to, but I think Eddie was in a very dark place still at the time. You, you read interviews with him, and he, he's, he sounds upbeat, but it's a kind of manic kind of upbeatness, if you know what I mean. It's It, it seems like he's in a quite fragile state where he could just tip over at any moment. And it feels like he's pouring so many ideas into the songs that everything ends up being about three times longer than it needs to be. Nothing kind of settles into a, a recognizable hook. Michael Anthony gets frozen out. He only plays on, I think four songs and yeah. I, I, you can't really hear his voice on there at all. If you can, which it, it, I don't know if it's on there, there but <laughs> yeah, it's... I can't hear him. Yeah. yeah, and I don't even think that that's Alex on fire in the hole. No, um, I think that's I Ed. I think Ed definitely played a bunch of the drums, and there are some program drums in there as well, aren't there? And and then Gary Sharon, I'm not the biggest fan of his, his singing anyway, but he wasn't really given the chance. I get the impression, like there are there are takes on there where you think you know Gary Sharon can sing this better, but they've just left this take on. Right. It, I, I I think that to some extent it's probably Mike Post's production. It's I don't know if he yeah. just had the the authority to kind of say, no, you're gonna do this again. You're gonna do this. There's just no kind of nothing to kind of bring everything together there. Well, direction. And what yeah. what drives me crazy about Fire in the Hole, 
because you're right, it is a really good song, and it's really more down the lane of, of Van Halen as to what we would expect from them, mm. but it's so damn thin sounding. The drum, yeah. I mean, even if it is Ed on the drums, it, it doesn't have any balls to it. It's like it's so thin. Yeah. There's, there's, such, there's... such a massive riff, too. It's like I want to feel the bass pedal, you know? I want to I want to feel the bass line. You don't feel it at all. It's like tinny. No. It's a lot of stuff on there that's just sonically weird. Um, you don't have that kind of big, rich kind of warmth that you expect of a, a Van Halen record, which you you, you know we're, we're familiar with. When you listen back to those those kind of classic Sunset Sound albums, and then you put this album that theoretically should sound so much better with you know two decades of advances in technology, and it just sounds like a pale, pale shadow. I'll give it up for without you, though. I like that one. Yeah, I it's. Like it's you. I like. I would like without you if it was like a lot of the songs. I think with some fairly severe editing, I'd like without you a lot more. It's everything on there could lose like three minutes. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, one I want is good too. But again, you're right. The songs are lengthy and really lacking direction yeah just some yeah confusing additional parts in that just don't need to be there that yeah um and i think van halen at their peak were always so concise just these perfectly formed kind of three minute songs just you know if there's a solo it's it's 20 seconds of perfect playing rather than two and a half minutes of playing that starts out amazing and then meanders off because it's just kept going and yeah for me just really needed a firm hand to kind of guide it and then things just went dark for years and it wouldn't be until 2004 that we get van halen returning and it's still it, it's still something's not right it, it just it's sad because ed was getting worse at that point when you saw pictures of him and video of him sammy returned to record three new songs for Best of Both Worlds, that was the double album compilation, 2004. They were supposed to make an album, but it just couldn't even get that done. It's about time, Up for Breakfast, Learning to See. Those are the three they did record with Sammy. You see, you like It's About Time and Learning to See, which I do like those. Not so hot on Up for Breakfast. And as we know, the Sammy reunion tour, disaster. Until 2007, again, goes dark, nothing. So now we got David Lee back. He returns for the tour. Wolfgang Van Halen takes over for Michael Anthony on bass. 2012. I want to ask you about this album. This is the last album we would get from Van Halen, last studio album, A Different Kind of Truth. Who would have thought, and who would have thought they could pull off an album this good? The singles, Tattoo, and She's the Woman, Blood and Fire, my sleeper pick from this album, which the album Me debuted too. at number two. Okay, cool. Yeah, they should have led with that as a single, I always say. It's incredible, it, yeah. It finds the history of the band, what they went through. Uh, many of the songs come out of early demos. What are your personal picks from the album? Now we know Blood and Fire. What else do you like on this? Yeah, Blood and Fire, obviously, yeah, tremendous. Based on on uh, Ripley, the instrumental from uh, the Wildlife soundtrack. Yeah, absolutely great. Yeah, amazing. Like the a band with like three guys who are basically kind of um, pretty much pensionable age, and one one guy just out of his teens can produce something that hard hitting um absolutely rem remarkable i've read some people kind of being quite critical of the fact that they base things on on early demos but i mean they're, they're really like massively elevated i think all of those songs from the original demo versions i mean particularly dave really put the work in and that they're you know better lyrics better melodies i think there are that they're heads and shoulders above those early versions which and is, is it's what they did on the first two albums anyway exactly they yeah went from they went back to the demos even on women children first even on fair warning you exactly, get some yeah. stuff yeah just running down the track list you tell me the ones you you really like here tattoo she's the woman you and your blues yeah you and your blues that that's i guess one of the the, the first sort of completely brand new records uh, new songs that they came up with for it and it really stands up to the to, to the earlier material there it's um lots Literally. of solid van halen hard rock cool. but also kind of bits of beatlesy melody as well yep, the yep. kind of thing that they've always done kind of really well chinatown um, what an open again, like so fierce yeah um you, you really get um 
some some of the the sense of uh, Wolfie's bass playing in there as well. Yes. I mean, I love Michael Anthony, and uh, like everyone else, I was sad that it was, that he wasn't uh, involved in the reunion. But I mean, Wolfie can do some things on the bass that uh, poor old Mike could just could never have done. And yep. yeah, Chinatown's one of the the places where that really shines through. I think the opening to Chinatown is really what Eddie wanted to do with Half for Teacher, and apparently there is a version where. He does the, the hmm. bass and guitar intro to Hot for Teacher together. They said, no, let's have just the guitars. Hmm. So that's Chinatown is really what he wanted to do. And yeah. yeah. Blood and Fire, we talked about Bullethead, as is. As is is amazing. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Um, just Miguel wild. To open. Boom, boom, <laughs> bah, boom, boom, bah. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely wild song. Just keeps taking kind of left turns when you least expect it. Really exciting stuff. Yeah. Honey Baby Sweetie Doll. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's I mean, probably not my favorite on the record. Yeah. But a lot of people don't it, like it. It still stands up well. Um, and I think they're not just resting on their laurels either. It's not just doing a pastiche of what you'd expect Van Halen to do. There are some things that you've never heard from them before on some of these, these songs. It's, um, it's pretty bold stuff and, and they just, they carry it off so convincingly. Yeah. You talk about Dave's lyrics, the trouble with never. I love when you turn on your stereo, does it return the favor? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Out of space, stay frosty, big river beats working. Those are the rest of the tracks. Yeah, it's Stay Frosty, um, I guess, harking back to, to, ice, sequel cream. to ice Cream. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think Eddie was saying that it started as just a, a Dave solo and then it was Wolfie who, who turned it into the, the Ice Cream Man style kind of electric kind of rave up. And uh, yeah, great stuff. So right, much so, fun. So let's finish out with, I want to give you the chance to defend Dave here on the 2015 live album, Tokyo Dome in Concert. When I read the book, I was pleasantly surprised. I was like, okay, somebody's defending this. So let's get to it. Dave took a lot of heat for the vocals on this. There is no overdubbing. Nothing was done. It was just, this is the actual concert recording. Put it out. Now, you write that Sammy Hagar and the other naysayers are missing the point. Absolutely. I I, I think anyone, I mean, I, I sadly never got to see... I never got to see any form of Van Halen live at all. I've just seen lots of videos, but I think anyone who had seen sort of early Roth era Van Halen would know that you're not going to get a recording of a note perfect Dave Lee Roth vocal performance from a, a, a live gig. That it really isn't the point, you know. The, the show is Dave doing what Dave does, and I, you know I've, I've got so many bootlegs where he's just in you know mid song he'll just start scatting or he'll see something that takes his fans in just start talking about it the us festival (laughs) perfect case in point uh he'll just hammered out of his mind yeah he'll just stop to do a a jump off something he'll forget the forget the words and go i forgot the fucking words yeah that's it that's what that's that's the experience and i love that instead of trying to clean it up and and create some kind of false impression that they had this really slick vocal performance i love that they just turned over the tapes exactly as they are completely honest thing i mean sammy can say what he wants about it but i'd rather listen to that than um, an entire concert that's been re-recorded and just over a recording of an audience. Live right here, from, right now. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. And it, maybe it would have benefited them more if they put it out as a video so you get the visual, because Dave is visual. That, I mean, that would have been cool too. I, don't, I kind of don't know why why they didn't do a visual version as well, but I, I'm, I'm still happy listening to it. I, I, I think you, you get a sense of the excitement of the occasion, the the playing's great. You you can hear them having fun. Oh no doubt. Um, ne- never there has never been a criticism of how the band sounds on that album. That is for sure. They're um, tight. Yeah, but it's it, it sounds like Dave's having a blast too, and it it just it, it's it's nice to just hear that kind of the camaraderie that that's that's going on there. And for me, that kind of spirit is much more important than having, you know, this no perfect vocal performance, um, which everyone seemed terribly disappointed that Dave hadn't delivered. But 
and he yeah. lived in Japan around that time. So he's speaking in Japanese, which is uh, that's interesting to hear Dave talking to Japanese. <laughs> so the book is out now, right? Van Halen, every album, every song. It's hey, out in the it UK is. now, and then I believe April 28th here in the States. Right. I, I, I should probably have found that out. I didn't know that, but I'm glad you did. Yes. Um, yeah, available in the UK from all the places that people normally order books from. Yeah, um, Amazon UK, Burning Shed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Waterstones, Blackwells, all of those places. Um, so if anyone feels like picking up a copy, that would be great. Yes, and where can people reach on line social media pages uh, yes absolutely i'm i'm on instagram um uh embarrassing instagram handle of uh, uh geek from the past ah, okay <laughs> <laughs> i will put the link in the show notes page geek from the past geek from the past hey, and this whole uh, show I'm... is geeking out on music so don't worry <laughs> exactly yeah and on twitter i'm mogo polo really? um, okay. so also embarrassing but yeah <laughs> if anyone wants to find me that's where i am cool all right morgan thanks so much it was great having you on uh no thank you so much for having me i, I love the show and it's, it's really great to just uh, talk to another fan that's it it's in the books